Welcome to another episode of Dad Up, everyone. Thank you guys very much for joining me. Uh, I am excited for the guest I have on today because uh, he's got some things in the works that he's working on and uh, promoting, and uh, I hope, I'm hoping that he's going to uh, make an impact or make an influence on you uh, to help not only change the uh, the culture that we live in now, but also the family culture that we have uh, or that is in the world right now. And uh, that's my good friend, Mike Cargiles, joined me on Dad Up. Welcome to the show, brother. Hey, thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me on. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You know, and as I told you before we started recording, you know, I came across, uh, I believe it was on social media that, uh, you know, you're running for Congress and that's awesome. Uh, but what I really liked about you is that you're very family oriented, very family. I mean, your family is very important to you. Um, they are your center, your world. Uh, but also you're a faith-based home. You live in a faith-based home and, and you really, you really, I mean, we talked about it. You said you pray be, be, before every interview, which I think is phenomenal. Uh, now this isn't a faith-based show. Uh, this is a, this is a parenting podcast. This is really to help parents, but I love those principles that you live by because those are the same principles that I live by family and faith. And um, that's just really important to me. So it just struck me because there's not a lot of politicians uh, that focus on those areas. And so I, I just like, I got to have this guy on my show. So I, I just, I'm really glad that you have taken the time to, uh, to, to do this for me. I really appreciate it, sir. Um, so my let's pleasure. get started. Sure. Uh, so your local California, let's talk a little bit about, about you, kind of how you grew up, um, kind of how you got into politics, and then uh, also uh, talk about your family as well. Okay. Well, I am an, a third generation army officer. So that was a lifetime ago when I was on active duty, but I was raised all over the world. Uh, my biological father was killed in Vietnam. Mm. Uh, my grandfather served in World War II, Korea, and had a battalion command in Vietnam. And then my mom remarried one of my dad's West Point classmates, and uh, he got two Purple Hearts. He was blown up twice in Vietnam. Oh, wow. And so, uh, you know, our family's been very military in the army, um, but I wanted to try something different. I uh, I had this dream of becoming a movie star. So <laughs> I said, let's let's head out west and head to Hollywood. Um, and that was uh, that was right after Desert Storm. So things uh, had, you know, I mean, that thing blew over in a week, basically. Mm -hmm. And so it was an opportunity uh, that I just wanted to sort of shift directions. Uh, I have a degree in accounting and finance. And and uh, I so I use that because, you know, when you're an actor in Hollywood, that's usually a part time gig. And uh, the joke was, I'm an actor. Well, which restaurant? Um, so I, I didn't want to do that. Uh, so I ended up working, uh, doing a couple of things. I worked with Haim Saban and the Power Rangers. Remember the Power Rangers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was involved in licensing and uh, a little private label manufacturing with the, the uh, Power Rangers. And, uh, and then I jumped into the music business for a little bit. And that's where I met my wife. She and her friends were groupies or followers of the band. I was It was a band from Australia. And they played bagpipes and rock and roll. Interesting. And, uh, they had just come off the road with Joe Walsh. Oh, cool. And uh, so we had uh, just kind of picked up. We were, the name of the band was Brother, and we were really like brothers. And it was a perfect time. The uh, the kilts and they had combat boots. And then this movie called Braveheart came out. And suddenly the whole world was in love with Celtic culture. And so we were touring everywhere. We were just having the best time. And uh, and out of all that, there was a lot of craziness going on. And that's when I got saved. I, uh, I had, uh, Things had sort of fallen apart for me. And I'd reached out to my old football coach. And he said, you know what? There's a church right down the road you need to go to. Hmm. So I went there. And uh, it turns out it was a church called Grace Community Church. And the pastor is a guy named John MacArthur. And uh, he he became a real defender of, of the church during the COVID time. But he baptized me. I met my wife uh, through the band. Our first date was going to church. And then, uh, you know, we started a family. And I had to sort of make a decision there. You know, do I want to keep pursuing this, this lifestyle here in 
Hollywood and all that? Or are we going to focus on our family? And so we chose that. So I moved out from the San Fernando Valley out here. and We got a house here in uh, the Pomona area. And I tell you what, I am the most blessed guy you're going to have on your show for a long time. <laughs> I really am. That's that's awesome. Uh, I think that's phenomenal. First of all, let me just say thank you for your service. Uh, I I spent four years in the Marines, so uh, we share that kind of that that uh, that I guess tradition together of of being in the military and serving our country. It's funny that you say after Desert Storm. Um, that's why I wanted to join the military was because of Desert Desert Storm. I saw I was I was working. I was going to college, and I was working, and I saw what was going on, and I was like, I have to help. I have to do something. And I went down to the local recruiting office, started talking to a couple of guys, talking to some friends that had been in the military. Uh, and they told me, you got to go in the Marines. You got to go in the Marines. I'm like, okay. So I go down and talk to them. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm serving, I'm serving for the Marine Corps. Uh, so I did four years. Uh, and uh, I too met my wife while I was in the military. Uh, and, you know, rest is history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so awesome. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, before we get into all the family stuff, uh, because mm -hmm. I do want to talk about that. Let's talk about, um, your current campaign and what you're really, um, your purpose behind why you're, why, why you are running for Congress and, and what's really the mission that's driving that. Well, I didn't want to do this. I mean, I kind of, I was having a good time. Uh, I classify myself as a filmmaker because I can, write, I can direct, I can produce, I can edit, I can do a lot of stuff. And and I was having fun. But I noticed that the lady that was representing this area represented none of my values, none of my opinions. And I was looking for someone to run against her because I wanted to bring my skill set behind them and help them with commercials and messaging. And no one would run against her. Hmm. The GOP out here is pretty much defunct. They, uh, they're they impotent at best. Mm -hmm. And after looking and looking and waiting and waiting, my wife said, I guess you're going to have to do it. So I said, okay, then then I'm all in. And so we, uh, we both agreed that this is something that has to be done full time. So I shelved everything I was involved with. And I've been a perpetual professional candidate since 2020. I believe I've had this race stolen twice from me, and that's another conversation. Uh, but but it is uh, something that that I feel deeply. I have to protect my family, your family, the families of our community from a whole host of evils that have only gotten worse since 2020. I mean, everything from open borders, you know, and with that comes not just the loss of jobs for local employers, but for the fentanyl poisoning, the human and child trafficking mm -hmm. that's taking place, the impact of these cartels is is measurable, very much so. And uh, and then other things like the economy. I think the Biden administration is destroying the economy, not building it up. This mm -hmm. Green New Deal has one purpose, and that's to tank the economy. There's no rationale for putting everybody on electric everything. Right. Electric stoves, electric heaters, electric cars, electric everything on a grid that can't sustain what we have right now. Right. You know, we have rolling blackouts and uh, and so, you know, when you're talking about a war on fossil fuels, it's not just the gas in your car we're talking about. We're talking about the gas in your stove, the gas mm -hmm. in your heater, in your water heater. But also we're talking about Everything from plastic to rubber, synthetics, these are all made from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a war on fossil fuels, then you're a war, you're in a war against our economy. And I believe, you know, the first thing Joe Biden did was shut down drilling, shut down refining, you know, basically on the whole. And uh, and then now we're in this slow spiral down. And then they've introduced things that are unfriendly to the environment. These giant solar panels that can't be recycled and stuff are filling up landfills. They're full of all kinds of toxic, you know, chemicals and stuff. And then we've got these giant bird blenders, these big fans in the desert that are destroying entire species of birds. And also they break down, they have to have petroleum in them to even operate. 
You can't recycle these carbon fiber blades. They're filling up landfills. When there's really common sense solutions, you know, if we're worried about what comes out of the tailpipe of a car, I'm a proponent of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very volatile, just like, you know, petroleum or, or gasoline, but out of the tailpipe comes water and air. And if we really need that much electricity, we have nuclear, very clean, you know, and, and today's technology, you know, we have plants all over the world. It's not an environmental hazard like it used to be. And there's different types of nuclear. And I think people like me, we have to rise up now and say, this is not working. And let me provide a different path forward for the economy, for, you know, and then we get into who I am as a person. I'm a Christian. And everything I do comes from my values as a Christian. Well, you know, there's a thing called the Constitution that we have. Very important document, right? <laughs> kind of runs everything. Right. And it's based off of, you know, we put out this first document called the Declaration of Independence. And then, so that's basically telling the world, this is what we're going to do. We're mm -hmm. going to build this new nation. And how are you going to build it? You know, colonialist. Well, let me show you. We're going to, and then we have this constitution, which shows the world how we're doing it. But they're both predicated on this idea of rights. You know, where do these rights come from? Do they come from the government or do they come from God? And the declaration is pretty clear. You know, this thing that Joe Biden can never remember. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created. Well, there's God, the mm -hmm. creator. And these created beings have rights that stem from our creator. So they, they're above the government. You know, these rights are outside the government. And it's a pretty good way to run a civilization. We've done it for hundreds of years. Right. You know, God defines what murder is, what lying is, what stealing is. And we've all agreed on this standard that sits outside of ourselves. And so it's really important that you have people like me in office who understand that there is a standard that's above my opinion that we are all held to. Because when you lose that standard, it drops down to my opinion. And then if you get a bunch of legislators who are ruling, you know, are legislating based on their opinion, that's called mob rule. That's pure democracy. Mm -hmm. And that's not what our founders had in mind. So we are literally being regulated and, and manipulated by a mob mentality that has no standard above themselves. And that is very, very dangerous for our country. Sorry, was that a long-winded? No, you're fine. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, you're fine. And I, I should preface this in just saying that, you know, for those of you that are watching or listening, this is not a, this is not a necessarily a podcast about politics and about your opinion on one way or the other, what you believe or don't believe or who you support or don't support. This is just merely a discussion that I am having with a gentleman that is running for Congress uh, and is a proponent in certain areas that he believes in. And it may be something that aligns with what you believe in and it may not. And if it doesn't, that's okay. But just have an open mind when you're watching this episode and, and, you know, hear what he has to say, hear what I have to say, but just have an open mind uh, and then base your opinions on it after the show. But um, for the most part, this is really, this is a parenting podcast. And this gentleman really represents uh, family values and structure within the home um, perfectly. And that's why I wanted to have him on. But at the same time, like I said, he's running for Congress. And so his goal, his mission is really to help change the way that we live and uh, the way that the, the things that are impacting us as a family or as a, as a society uh, in this general area, anyways, uh, affecting us as a society needs to uh, needs to have change. And there's, I'm sure you've seen it yourself. It there needs to be some change happening. And right. He's just trying well, to. He's just trying to do that. We're here to protect the family. Correct. And that's that's not just rhetoric. We right. want to. I, you know, I'm a proponent of the Second Amendment. Why? Because I think a father should have the right to defend his family from whatever comes through that front door. And as we have more and more criminals on the streets and they're doing less and less to incarcerate, the odds of something malevolent coming through your front door are growing greater and greater. Correct. And I want to empower those parents to be able to defend their kids and themselves from whatever comes through that front door. 
which means you have to have sufficient firepower to meet, you know, if you've got some armed uh, gang members or you've got some jihadis that are coming through, you know, because they're on a, a crusade to destroy you and your family and our country, you need to be able to meet force with force. And I don't know, you know, really interesting thing is we've had this huge influx of Latinos into our country, mm -hmm. especially in this area. You know, we're 60% Latino and I've never talked to a Latino dad, brother, father, uncle that didn't want the right to defend their kids and their family and their wives and their daughters from any sort of evil that comes through that front door. And it's the same thing, you know, that's one side. And then we protect the kids in school. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, if, if there's a recent video of me addressing the school board here in Chino, and there's this big question of sexual content in the schools. Well, I want to protect the little minds of our kids too. Mm -hmm. My old pastor put it best. He said, if you know what a doctor knows, you would be a doctor. Right. If you know what a lawyer knows, you would be a lawyer. Right. And when a child knows what an adult knows, they're no longer a child. Right. You've destroyed the psychology, the emotional center of this little child, and you've made them an adult too early, and they're not able to handle it. And you've destroyed their childhood, and you've brought them into a world of adulthood that they're incapable of handling. Right. And this is a crime against our children. So I stand hard against these things. And this is not a subjective call. I read two penal codes to the school board and said, look, if any of this material is in your libraries or your classroom, it is illegal. It's on its face. There's no, there's no give here. If this is in your classroom, it is illegal and you should be arrested. The same way we used to have, you know, magazines behind a dark, you know, counter, you couldn't get to, minors couldn't get to it. It's right. the same thing. Minors should not have access to certain material, especially on a school campus. It's just black and white. Right. And if we refuse to enforce these laws, we're condemning these children. And, uh, and again, I stand against that. I stand against boys and girls sports. You know, boys are different. Girls right. are different. And there shouldn't be men and women's locker rooms. Right. You know, these are you know, five years ago, these were common sense issues. And now I'm some sort of, you know, uh, friends, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. No. I'm, just, I'm just a dad trying to defend my family against this onslaught. And a lot of it's emanating from Hollywood. And I get it because I saw it years ago and I saw the creep. I saw the Chinese buying production companies over and over. So we are being completely manipulated as a country, as a culture, and we need to stand firm. Our dads need to stand up and defend our wives. We need to defend our kids, our homes. And, uh, and I want to defend the dad's occupation. So he has a way to provide for his family against this collapse of our economy. Right. Um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Well, let's, let me ask you this, you know, we're talking about, you know, being a parent and all that. How, um, how many kids do you have and what are their ages? I have two kids, uh, 21 and 23 now. Okay. So, I mean, you're right in the, right in the same wheelhouse as me. I've got two boys, uh, and they are, uh, my, my oldest will be 25 tomorrow. And then, oh, wow. uh, my youngest, uh, is just turned 22 a couple months ago. So, um, so yeah, we're right in the same wheelhouse. I mean, I'm a firm believer in that protecting our family. It, and, you know, quite frankly, Mike, I don't care what the laws say. If somebody comes into my house that's unwanted and is not, you know, is, would be deemed uh, an enemy or trying to hurt my family. I don't care what the laws are. Uh, they're going to be stopped. <laughs> and I don't right. know, I, I don't know what measure I will go to, but I'm afraid to find out for myself and for that other person. But yes, there will be protection for my family, regardless of what the laws are. Absolutely. Amen. And yeah. that's tr and that's just right. That's just right. You should have that and there should be no threat or legal ramification for you defending your home against intruders or invaders. That's just, do. that's not the American way for you to worry. You know, there was this mass shooting down in Texas a few months ago, and 
turns out this this guy was blowing people away at a mall and there was actually a bunch of people with concealed carry weapons all around him that could have negated this threat quickly but they chose not to because they knew what was going to happen in the courts the minute they stopped this guy and they turned and they walked away because they didn't want to lose their families to an overzealous DA, you know, yeah. and, and and that's where we are. And that's not right. That's yeah. not right. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, let me ask you this, because there's a couple things that I want to go over real quick. You know, as far as as far as being a parent, I should say, how has being a parent influenced you in your approach to politics? Well, again, everything is family centered. My campaign, when you see my yard signs everywhere, it says the family man. Mm -hmm. uh, to my Latino friends, I'm el hombre de familia. And that's it. That's it. Everything I look at legislatively will be through the lens of does this hurt or help our families? And when I say family, I'm I'm not any any people group does not constitute a family. I'm a proponent of the nuclear family. Mom and dad have kids. They raise their kids with their values, their religion. And that is the family unit. That's the family unit that's been historic for thousands and thousands of years. And somehow today's academics want to redefine what is a family. Mm -hmm. That's not right. I stand in support of the nuclear family. Mom and dad are the principal influences of their children. They're given to them by God. And they're responsible for them, not the school. You know, we have this lawsuit going on right now where mm -hmm. Gavin Newsom wants teachers to be secret keepers from parents. Yeah. Where if a child is acting out, you know, some sort of transgender sexual thing, something that the teachers have been advocating for. And then the kid goes, well, hell, that sounds kind of interesting. Let's experiment. But I know my parents won't like it. And Gavin Newsom is telling the parents, you're not allowed to know. I want the teachers to keep secrets from the parents. And that's between you and the kids and the parents don't need to know. And if if the parents don't like it and you feel it's an unsafe environment, we're going to remove you from your home and we're going to put you in foster care or CPS mm -hmm. and you can do your transitioning and everything there. And you don't even have to go back home. And what they're after is a an administrative tool that's what the superior court's working on right now, where they can tell you your home is unsafe. And because of that, we're going to remove your children. And then they're going to redefine what unsafe is. Is there a gun in the house? That's unsafe. We're going to remove your kids. You know, are you deemed a, you know, non-compliant with our social credit score or, you know, you're unvaccinated, whatever it is, they're going to redefine what unsafe is. And it's the ultimate tool for compliance. You do what we say or we remove your kids. And that's what we're really up against here. I'm for empowering parents. I want parents to have choices where they take their kids, what schools they put their kids in. I'm a big advocate of school choice because ultimately I want the parents to be in charge of their kids, not the school and not the state. Yeah. Um, I, I, that's, that's great. I agree with that. Um, I think, you know, just in what you just finished saying there, as far as having the choice to send our kids to whatever school we'd like, I mean, my wife and I were not big, uh, supporters of the public school system here in, in Southern California, in our area, the Chino Valley area, we were not big fans of the way that the school system was being run. Uh, and we elected to send our kids to private school from the ages of kindergarten all the way up through high school. Uh, that was just our uh, choice. We wanted our kids to be raised and educated in a, in a faith-based environment. Uh, and that was our choice. And yeah, we paid a lot of money to have that done. Absolutely. It, so did it's we. very, very expensive, but yeah. that was what My we kids believed went to in. Ontario Christian. Oh, okay. Uh, from K through middle school. And oh. then uh, they were swimmers. So there was no pools in the school system over there. So they opted to go right over there at Chino Hills at Ayala. And they were both swimmers at Ayala. Oh, that's um, awesome. So I got I got the private public. Uh, and, and I'm telling you, it's parents have to be involved. Uh, if your kid, either, it doesn't matter, if private or public, you have to be involved in your child's life. 
And, uh, and I had, if you go and look on my bio on my website, one of the funniest things people always say is because I, I list all these things I've done. And one of them up front is I was a crossing guard. And, and it was because at Ontario Christian, they were having an enormous problem with buses coming in and having almost near misses with kids and cars and stuff. And the principal came to me and said, Mike, I, we got to do something. And I said, Keith, his name was Keith Lucas. Give me a stop sign and a vest and I'll take care of your problem. And in a period of about six months, I recruited all these dads, not moms. I recruited all these dads and we ran that parking lot with military precision. And then once a month, we'd all go have breakfast together. And, uh, and we ran the parking lot. And to this day, I still think there's dads over there running the parking lot. Now we, you know, some moms eventually joined us and, you know, we're, we're okay with that. Um, but, but that's how we took care of it. The dads stepped up. A lot of them were coaches. We were all coaches with CYAA, Christian Youth Athletic mm -hmm. Association. And uh, I was a board <laughs> member there, coached on many, many teams. Um, but that's, that's it. Dads lead the way. Dad yeah. up. When you, when I saw your invite, I'm like, amen, this is my guy because we, we lead our families. And, you know, as a Christian, you know, you get into what's a dad. I don't know if you want to go there, mm -hmm. you know, sort of the, the what That's is right. a dad? What is a husband? You know, and when I talk to guys that are having marriage problems and, and stuff, I, I first, I, I don't look at your wife. I'm looking at you. Look at me. I'm looking at you because in the Bible, it's in Ephesians 5, it's real clear on this that men are the ones that die for their wives. It says, you love your wife as Christ loved the church. And what's really interesting about that section is it never tells the wife to love her husband, but it tells the husband to love her wife. How much? As much as your own body. You die for your wife. She is your priority more than yourself, more than anything. And what's really great about that is when you love your wife to that point, she can't help but love you back. Right. She doesn't have to be told to love you. She will love you. You know, and then you people get in this whole thing about being subject to your wife. That's literally a military term because earlier in the same section, it says be subject to one another. So but in the army, you know, as a company commander, you got one guy in charge, and that's what God did with the family unit. He said, I'm going to hold one person responsible for this family unit. The kids, the wife, everybody's to support this leader because I'm holding him responsible. And I look at the husbands. How is your relationship with God? How is your relationship with your wife? Are you being selfish? Are you placing her first? And that's really the key to a successful marriage. Will you die for your wife? And then that doesn't mean jump in front of a bullet. That means I place her needs and wants above my own mm -hmm. consistently. What do I need to do for you? How can I help you? And in helping her, you help yourself. And that's the key to a healthy marriage. And then what is a, you know, if you go to Proverbs 31, it has this, this full chapter of description of what an excellent wife is. Mm -hmm. You know, she does this and she does this. And these guys go, I want my wife to be like that. Well, we're okay. That's fine. Are you like the Ephesians 5 husband? Right. You know, are you doing yours? If, if you want her to look like this, what are you doing over here? Well, you know, I, I right. got to go play golf. I got to go see the Rams or the Lakers. Well, where's your wife in that equation? Right. You know, you're yeah. not being a dad. You're being self-centered. Yeah. You die for your family. They become your number one priority. And then everything sort of works itself out from there. Yeah, uh, that's uh, you're absolutely right. You hit the nail on the head. Um, I do have to go back to what you were talking about, though, because it's kind of cracked me up when you mentioned Ontario Christian. Uh, you're probably this is kind of off topic, but you're probably uh, familiar then with Western Christian High School in Upland. Absolutely. That's where my boys went. <laughs> and not only that. I was a high school. I was the the uh, associate head coach at the high school at the basketball team for the varsity basketball team uh, at Western Christian for five years. Wow. Uh, so yeah, yeah, so I did. I was able to coach my boys uh, all the way up through high school, and then even after my youngest graduated, he got a basketball scholarship and graduated, and went on to college. 
I still coached for another two years, even after he was gone. Uh, so because I loved the impact I was making on the boys and, uh, some of those kids that I coached, um, didn't have the father figure in their life. So they looked at me as like their mentor or their father figure. And that's, that's what meant. That's what I enjoyed the most about it. But, um, so that's, that's well, you know, and I, I get criticized a little bit because people, they go, well, I haven't seen you at city council and you haven't been civically and all this. And I go, when I got kids right? and my kids were athletes. So my kids went the swimming route. So our family was literally seven days a week. We were at swim practice or at meets and stuff. And that's where I invested my life, not in community cleanup, but in raising two godly kids who were, you know, pretty supercharged athletes. Um, that takes up a lot of time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, know, I know that. Uh, but you also mentioned uh, CYAA, Christian Youth Athletes Athletic Asso Association. Uh, Athletic Association. The reason I mentioned, uh, the reason uh, I think that's interesting is because I actually coached in that league. Uh, did you? When my boys were when my boys were younger, I actually coached in that league for I think I did about three seasons coaching there. Um, so uh, it's. Anyways, small world, but we are yeah. local to each other. So, um, well, that's great. I want to ask you this though: when it comes to running a campaign, it's very, very time-consuming. It's very tiresome. Uh, you're constantly, you know, out on, you know, essentially the local roads. You're out on the roads, uh, out on the beat, kind of meeting people and doing your thing to really get your name out there. Um, but how have you, because you're so family-oriented, how have you balanced, you know, being there for your family when you when you need to devote so much time to being um, to running for Congress? Well, it is, it is a, a balancing act. I won't lie. It, uh, you can get completely absorbed in this and, uh, and I have to take definitive breaks from, you know, because I, again, I've been a perpetual candidate since 2020. Uh, most right. candidates jump in a few months before a race and start this. So, I, you know, in all that, I have developed a little bit of a, a mechanism where I can just shut it down and focus on, you know, whatever we're doing, yard work or going somewhere, doing something. And uh, and it's nice for me, too, because I, I need to. But it's hard. It sits in your mind 24 seven. There's always stuff to do, always things that need to be done. Um, events that are coming up or people you need to meet or or podcasts you need to be on, you know, things like that. So. Um, it, it is, but, but that's the game. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's my life and that's, uh, I have to get this right. Uh, not only for my family, but for my constituents. Um, I do believe that, and, and I think I am in the greatest district in California. I really do. I think the Inland Empire is amazing. You know, we have, we have the, the drag strip at, at the Fairplex at Pomona. We were there just a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. You saw a car do 337 miles an hour. I know, it's insane. A quarter mile. Unbelievable. And it's loud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, uh, it, it, it moves your heart. I mean, uh, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, and then at the other end of the district in Fontana, you know, there's a, the NASCAR track, mm -hmm. uh, the Auto Club Speedway. Got two great gun ranges down at Rahagas and Prado. Mm -hmm. uh, got an international airport in Ontario and civic centers. And I got four mega churches. Churches that are about 10,000 members each and hundreds and hundreds of smaller churches. Mm -hmm. But that's sort of the character of the district. People who like to go see cars, people who like to shoot guns and people who like to go to church. Kind of my people. <laughs> yeah, uh, yours and uh, and our, our good uh, local buddy uh, Kurt Hagman as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Um, yep. I, I want to ask you this though: when when it comes to um, you know being maybe being a civic servant, uh, parents, I know there are. I've I've met people that have said, "Why I'm, I'm not going to bother voting? My vote doesn't. It's not going to count anyways." It's like, why even waste my time voting? And that ultimately impacts our children. They see how we are towards, you know, the election and things like that. And they don't really understand that even just a little bit helps, even if it's just your one little vote, it does help. But kids are raised right now in seeing kind of this disconnect with people in, in getting involved in civic communication. I mean, uh, civic uh, community, being involved in their community and also in voting and all that. How can parents really encourage just the opposite? Meaning how can they encourage 
uh, I guess through their own actions, I guess I'm answering my own question, but how can they encourage their kids to, about being involved in the community and being a, a civil servant or a civil, you know, uh, community member? Well, you did it first and, and we did it together. We, we were involved, we were coaching, mm-hmm. you know, for, you have to be an example. You right. can't, you can't just talk the talk. You've got to walk the walk. And so by being involved in your school, being involved in your kids' lives, you're giving them an example to follow. And that extends itself now from coaching and, and being involved there to being involved you know, civically or in the elections process. And that's just one facet. You, know, you can volunteer for things at your church or mm-hmm. your community, but you want to show your kids. You want them to be a part of it, but you want to be the example. And that's where parents have to step up because right now these kids are trapped in this environment of smartphones and Mm -hmm. disconnect. Yeah. They don't talk to each other. They don't talk to anybody. And if they can, they will withdraw into this black hole of, of solitude. And that's so dangerous, not only for their psychological and their emotional development, but when something bad happens, there's no support network. Mm -hmm. You know, who do you reach out to? You know, and this this sort of dovetails into a conversation I had with a lot of people on Veterans Day. Uh, I spoke at an Elks Lodge, or it was Lions Club. Um, but my mom and I had had this discussion a few years back. My grandfather fought in three wars and nef- never suffered PTSD. My dad got back from Vietnam, never suffered PTSD. And yet we have almost 18 18 soldiers a day committing suicide, PTSD, and a whole bunch of others. And we were trying to wrap our heads around this. Why? Why is this occurring? And it all comes back to the issue, the core issue you and I are discussing, family. See, in the past, you would go, you would fight for your country, you would do these things. And when you came back home, there was a family there for you. Mm -hmm. You had your mom, your dad, your girlfriend, your wife. Everyone was waiting on you to come home. There was a family that would embrace you after this horrific experience you you experienced, you know, defending mm-hmm. your country. But now today, the the unit that soldier leaves is more family to them than what they come back home to. The broken family. There's no one there. There's a complete disconnect. Everybody's on their little, and you. You're coming home from this horrific experience and probably dealing with something that's called survivor's remorse. You know, you saw friends killed and you lost people here and yet you made it home and you feel guilty about making it home. And there's no one to come around you and say, hey, we're here for you. We're thankful you survived and we want to help you. That unit is gone now. And so when they come home, they're alone, they're lost. And the only thing that happens is the VA medicates them into a a stupor and they realize there's nothing for me here. And if I can't go back to my unit, why do I even even need to be on planet Earth? Mm -hmm. And they take their lives. And this is a crime. This is a crime against our society and those who have stepped up to defend this nation. And that's part of my message, the family man. I need to restore, do everything I can to restore that family so that when our warriors do come back, they're not prone to taking their own lives and they can integrate into the businesses of our community and then the relationships of our community. That's paramount. Yeah. Um, I am a, I am a firm believer in the strength of the family culture, the strength of the family structure. Um, I often compare you know, the relationship between a husband and wife is really the foundation to a healthy, uh, not only marriage, but a healthy family structure or culture. And one of the things that I talk about is that I I say that there is one little crack in that, um, that relationship between you and your wife, meaning if there's one crack in that foundation, it's hard to manage a happy, healthy family culture or um, structure. And so for me, I'm a big proponent of, you know, the healthy relationship between a husband and wife and how important it is to 
spend time together, to constantly work at your relationship, uh, to be an, be examples, as you're referring to, being examples to your children um, in, in the way that you treat each other and how you love each other. Um, and I'm a firm believer in, you know, counseling as well. I mean, my wife and I uh, have a marriage coach. She's a licensed family therapist. And we go to the, we go and see her once a month and we've been doing it now for the better part of five years. And it's something that we enjoy doing and it helps to keep our relationship healthy uh, and strong. And it's a direct uh, message to our two grown adult boys who, you know, are at, at any time could go off and, and get married, find, find love and get married they see how their parents model a relationship and model a family culture or structure. So um, it's so important for us as dads uh, to step up and take that role, take that, take that challenge head on uh, because it's super important and and vital to uh, having a healthy, um, healthy children uh, for that matter. Can you Um, imagine how different our society would look? If we all live by treat others the way you want to be treated. Yeah. Amen. For sure. It's, <laughs> I mean, it, it's it, just, just the way it is. And that's yeah. the message we have to carry forward. That'll, that'll save your marriage. That'll save your kids. Treat others, you know, or love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. Treat others the way you want to be treated. And if you would make that your first reaction to everything. And, and that's how I, Everything from my immigration policy to my economic policy is, is grounded on that. And that's treat others the way you want to be treated. That's yeah. how I would want that. And this is what I want for you and your families. Right. Um, yeah. And, and you know, I've actually had people say, well, it's easier said than done uh, because I have, you know, this person or that person or I have the neighbor that I just, you know, we don't get along and we can't communicate I understand everybody's going to have those challenges in their lives, but if you start living by the principles as treating others as, as they should be treated and as you would like to be treated, if you start having living by that mentality, um, loving thy neighbor, as the Bible says, right? If you start living by that, being that one person to try to make change, it will ultimately start to snowball and impact other people. Um, so yeah, I absolutely, um, absolutely love that. Let me ask you this, when it comes to initiatives or your policies, uh, that you're maybe working on to support families. Um, what would those be as far as being in the community to support families? Um, what would your be policies or initiatives be for you? Well, again, I'm running federal level. So we're not, we're not talking about cleaning the streets and stuff like this. We're talking about constitutional level things. Uh, one of which we've already discussed a little bit is the second amendment, your right to defend you and your family. Um, and I do think that we, uh, as a country have failed our educational system. You know, we, we need to get back to more STEM oriented stuff, but we also need to, and Bill Clinton is at fault for this, but, but we need vocational training in our schools. You know, not every kid needs to go to college. We have kids that are great with their hands. They're very gifted, but they're not, they hate being in a classroom. Right. My son had a friend of his who was at Chino Hills High School, terrible student, hated being in school, went to uh, Mount Sac, learned how to weld. You know, he's doing nose cones on SpaceX hmm. right now. He's wow. a gifted welder, wow. like like a very gifted welder. Hmm. He would have never known this out of the high school and the middle schools because we got rid of vocational training. You know, and this extends even, I've talked to some firemen that said, we've got all these recruits on paper. They're great. But I put a wrench in their hand and they go, how do you use this? (laughs) (laughs) You know, we've got to turn the pipes on and off. Forget about structural integrity of a building, where to assault, where not to assault. We don't know how to turn the valve off. You know, they've been, so we need to get behind our kids, get, we need to reintroduce, you know, uh, home ec and, and auto shop and, and, and woodworking and welding and, and all these things. And, and this is where I, I you know, the, the journeyman programs with a lot of the unions are amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my wife is a member of IBEW, uh, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And they have a journeyman program, a training program where, you know, you learn skills. And uh, unions and I don't see eye to eye on everything, but this is one program 
or one one aspect of labor unions, I think they need to get involved and help us reintroduce at middle school level so that if your kid is not going to go to Harvard, um, then let's teach them a skill. So the, by, by the time they graduate high school, they're employable. They're, mm-hmm. they're a skilled artisan or tradesman uh, and, and can do whatever we need. You know, pipe fitter, uh, you know, electrical, doesn't matter. Uh, we need to get back because that's going to be the foundation for manufacturing, which has been leaving this country. And that's the, the creation of wealth is creating something that someone else wants. Mm-hmm. And right now we're becoming a sor- service oriented society. We don't make anything. We just consume things. And that's the death of a society. We need to get our manufacturing base, which means the people they would employ in this manufacturing base have to be more than just warehouse workers. And we see this exploding all over the Inland Empire, warehouses, warehouses, you know, but that's a a, a minimal, minimal skill level job. And they're making it more and more done by robots. So it's get less and less of a, a personal, and you can't you can't raise your family on that. You can't grow your city on warehouses. Right. All it does <laughs> is deplete your infrastructure. We've got to get back to what's the skill level. We need trained kids exiting mm-hmm. high school, employable on day one, but we have to have jobs for them to go into. I guess is is that sort of a basic level answer to your question because. I know that's a broad answer, but but that's the the level I'm looking at. How do I bring industries, manufacturing yeah. into this to provide jobs? And this cascades into a whole host of things. You know, we've got this homeless epidemic right now. We've got mm-hmm. the military industrial complex going nuts. And we have the homeless industrial complex going nuts here in California. And people go, well, how do you address that? And I go, well, let's Let's reverse engineer it. There's a thousand ways to become homeless. It's just a condition. It's not a disease. Right. But when you're no longer homeless, the one thing you need to provide yourself is a place to live. And you do that with a job. Right. So let's focus on jobs so that if you're, it's a drug center you're coming out of or a broken family or whatever it is, when you get through the other end, there's a job for you. Mm-hmm. And it's a good paying job that allows you to take care of yourself. And if you need to, your kids, it all comes back to the, the family. Yeah. What do I need to do to protect those kids, protect the family as they go to school? We don't need a bunch of, you know, drugs and stuff on the streets and homeless and prostitutes surrounding these school campuses. We need to make that a safe environment. The neighborhoods need to be safe. And that kind of cascades into open borders and, and all of that sort of thing. So it's a it's big. Right. But that's that's the job I've signed up for. And and I see a, a move in the right direction, but it's only based on what is best for our families. Yeah. Uh I absolutely, absolutely love that. And I, I think it's so important. Uh, you know, I, I've said it, I said it earlier in the show, it's just our family structure needs to be strong and we need to learn how to uh, promote our family within the community, um, and not only locally, but nationally. Uh, we need to learn how to support and promote our own families and teach our kids the importance of um, community involvement, right? Um, so, I, I mean, I totally agree with what you're saying. I do want to ask you this before I, I we're cutting short on time. So I want to ask you this before uh, before we close out here. Um, how about your own kids? If they were to have they expressed an interest in getting into politics uh, and then maybe if there's some advice that you might have for parents that may have a child that doesn't want to go to college, they just want to pursue this opportunity of maybe getting into office somehow. Um what advice would you give to them? And, and based on your own experiences, what what have your kids shown you as far as when it comes to uh, politics? Well, my it's funny because my son graduated college with a degree in political studies. Oh, so, there you go. <laughs> there you go. So he uh, he's helping me out, and uh, and we're looking at other things in the area uh, for him to to come alongside maybe some city leaders and help them. Uh, because we need a lot of help. There's yeah. just a lot that needs to be done. 
And we didn't even touch on police and the war on law enforcement uh, that's going on right now that provides the security for everything we just said. Um, but yeah, my kids, yeah, with me in the house, how can you escape being right. around politics? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so our our dinner table discussions usually are, you know, something around the Middle East or, or Central America or or some sort of, you know, economic policy that's being, you know, forced on us through the, the Newsom machine. Right. Um, but I have a lot of hope for our area. Uh, a lot of it's a lot of it, believe it or not, comes from the Latino community who I believe are inherently, you know, they're inherently conservative with family values. I don't know a single dad, as I said earlier, that doesn't want to protect their family mm -hmm. with what's coming through the door. They want to protect their daughters from from, you know, predators, you know, either on the sports field or in the locker rooms or in the bathrooms. And they don't want California to dictate to them how they raise their families and the indoctrination that they're suffering. You know, the last thing a dad wants is for his, you know, his boy to come home and say, my teacher told me I'm, I can be a girl now. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Men can have babies. Did you think that would be something taught in schools five years ago? No, it's yeah. ridiculous. You know, and we, who possess the truth have to stand up and defend the truth. You know, that's, that's political that, you know, that's, that's science fiction. That's not science. Right. You know, science has been uh, you know, taught for thousands of years. And what's going on here is, is a destruction of the things, the foundations that made this country great. And we as dads and fathers have to stand up for the truth. Yeah. Uh, uh, perfectly said. I, I agree with you. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, just kind of getting back to what we were talking about before, when it comes to the college thing, yeah, I agree. There are kids that don't need to go to college. They just don't. Um, that's not something that would fit them well. Uh, you know, and quite frankly, there are a majority of the kids that get out of college, you know, unless you're specifically going for, you know, a specific career like doctor or lawyer or something like that, kids that get out of college, that have no idea what they're going to do. And they graduate college and they don't have a job and they're living at mom and dad's because they're still trying to find work because they really don't know what they want to do yet. And so, yeah, it, trade schools might be the way to go. Um, and maybe it's not even trade school. Maybe it's, you know, getting into uh, politics or something along those lines as well. Like your boy, you know, has done with you, uh, I think is great. Um, but uh, Mike, I want to ask you this because we are short on time. I do want to let you go. I know you have a busy schedule. Um, best place for uh, my viewers, listeners to look you up, learn a little bit more about you, uh, maybe help help you out in any way they can. Well, I'm all over social media, Cargyle for Congress. And uh, the best place to plug in is the, the website. And that's Cargyle for Congress. That's C-A-R-G-I-L-E-F-O-R. And uh, I, like I said to you earlier, I have the best, most cheesy catchphrase in the country. And I say, smile, it's Cargyle. There you and go. Laugh just like that. And then right. they never forget it. I have right. people come up to me months and months later and they go, oh, you're the smile guy. You're the yeah, smile guy. That's <laughs> because I know what we're up against and I have a solution. And if we can get together behind this vision, I think we can turn this ship around. And uh, and I think the best days can be ahead of us. Um, but we're on a knife knife's edge right now of right. losing the country. And it started with the collapse of the nuclear family. Mm, yeah. Uh, awesome. Well, Mike, uh, I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, to sit down with me and chat about uh about everything you're doing and also about your family and, and the family culture, the family structure. And we've, we've talked about it many, several times throughout the episode, but I appreciate you. I'm looking forward to staying in touch with you. I'm looking forward to helping out any way I can. And uh, it's been a pleasure, my friend, for having you on. Thank you so much. Honor and a pleasure here. God bless you. God bless you, Mike. And listen, guys, this has been another awesome episode of Dad Up uh, with my good friend, Mike Cargyle. Please make sure you check out what he's doing. Everything's in the show notes. You can go to his links there. Everything's in the show notes. Please make sure you check out what he's doing. Help him out any way you can. And 
If you would, please do me a favor. If you have not yet subscribed to my show, please make sure you do that so you don't miss any of the awesome guests that I have on each and every week. And as always, I look forward to seeing you all on the next episode of Dad Up. Wow, another amazing episode in the books. So much was shared and I'm truly grateful my guest was able to pour into you to help you elevate your dad game and really dad up. Make sure you bang that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. And while you're here, please don't forget to leave me a rating and a review. I always appreciate the feedback. And one last thing, don't forget, your role as a dad is one of the most important roles you have. So if you need a little help or have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me on my website at daduptribe.com or at my Instagram page at daduppodcast. Until next time, everyone, dad up.